Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere, and even earn money, all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then, you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for Podcasters, I feel like I've been having a lot more connection with my listeners through the Q&As and polls. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com forward slash podcasters to get started. Hi everyone, I'm Amber Rose, the Religious Hippie, and welcome to A Catholic's Perspective. For those of you just finding this podcast, let me tell you a little about myself. I was born and raised a cradle Catholic until I fell away from the church for eight years. I just recently came back to the church and I could not be happier with where I am today. I am currently a junior in college and I'm studying graphic design. I am an ambassador for multiple amazing Catholic Christian companies and I love working with all of them. Now, some of you may already know me from my popular religious hippie social media channels, such as TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I have all kinds of Catholic content on there, so don't forget to go check those out. So the reason I wanted to start a podcast was so that I'd be able to have a longer format which people could listen to from wherever they are. I particularly wanted to address issues that young Catholics face today in the secular world, and I want to do that by providing information along with commentary and even a little of my own opinion. I can't lie, from time to time I might be discussing very controversial issues, and some will find my opinions unappealing. But I do this out of my faith and service to God. We must keep communicating with each other, respecting each other, and put each other on the path to sainthood. I think you'll enjoy the podcasts coming up, and I thank you for being here with me. Hi everyone, and welcome back to my podcast. Today I have some special people with me from JMJ Missions, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about what it means to be a man in the Catholic Church and all of that fun stuff. So welcome guys, why don't you tell my um, listeners about yourselves? So my name is Dan Palmieri, we're a group called JMJ Missions. Uh, I'm the main speaker, do church missions, things like that. Uh, we make videos. We're on pretty much every, almost everywhere you are, Amber. I don't know if we're on every platform that you're on, but we're on, you know, yeah, right. YouTube, uh, you know, we, we do talks in churches. We have podcasts uh, such as this one. Um, you know, we just got a TikTok recently, so we're a little late in the game there, but you know, better late than never. So we're pretty much everywhere. I just want to bring Christ to all people, one soul at a time. It's like our mantra. I love it. Very nice. And uh, my name's Anthony. So Amber, thanks for having us. Yeah. And like Dan said, you know, we're three best friends who are, we kind of made it our mission to spread the gospel one soul at a time. And what I do in JMJ Missions is I run the social media, like the Instagram, the TikTok, uh, the Facebook. And I also give talks to confirmation students, kids about to make their confirmation. So those are kind of my two main facets in JMJ. Rock, if you want to take it. Hey everyone, my name is Rocco. Um, I am the uh, videographer and editor for JMJ Missions. Uh, I actually have a background, a degree in film uh, from college, so I applied those gifts and talents that God gave me uh, and channeled it towards this ministry, so I'm very happy to be doing that. I love it. I'm glad that you guys uh, agreed to be on the podcast today. I think this is a great one. I haven't done anything related to the genders in the Catholic Church and what their specific roles are. So I think you guys will be great examples, especially since Dan is a new dad and you guys yeah. have, you know, you guys have experience. So um, we, uh, we, limited, we just <laughs> limited experience. We don't really know what we're doing. We're kind of like faking it until we make it right now. But any uh, insight I can give, I'd be happy to try my best to give it <laughs> i love it how how old's the baby like five days <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys are like me and uh me and anthony uh just met him anthony <laughs> met him for the first time two days ago, days ago yeah. i met him i met him mm -hmm. yesterday he's so tiny and just yeah. 
just oh adorable. There's no words. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, he's literally tiny. Yeah. Percentile. But, mu today. but muscular, right, Dan? Muscular. <laughs> yeah. He's, well, okay. Talk, talk, we're talking about men, right? He's randomly jacked. My <laughs> oh, my um, goodness. He's like, okay, okay, I'm not trying to brag. I'm a proud father, but I'm trying not to brag. It's just funny. He almost rolled over twice already. He's not supposed to be able to do that for like three months. Um, and it's literally because he was really mad that we were trying to change his diaper. <laughs> and so Honestly? Him, yeah. Honestly, sometimes righteous anger makes you do things. <laughs> righteous yeah. anger. So funny. I love it so much. All right. Well, I think we're just going to jump right into the questions if you guys are set with that. Yeah, cool. Sounds okay. Good. All right. So I guess the first question I want to ask you guys is what are your own experiences as men in the Catholic Church? I would say for, for me, I had a lot of beautiful, wonderful experiences uh, as, a, as a man in the Catholic Church, starting with my conversion uh, early on, um, 19, I, I had always uh, been a practicing Catholic, but not to the extent that would follow uh, after my, my conversion, after meeting a lot of great priests, one priest in particular, um, and really just having a lot of beautiful, fruitful, sp spiritually fruitful experiences early on, going to the land where the Blessed Mother uh, appeared, uh, in Batania, Venezuela, meeting a lot of beautiful people there, beautiful family. Um, and it was just all a true joy and blessing for me. And it, it's been following like that ever since. So, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, for me, like uh, the male influence in a church has been huge for me. I mean, I feel like kind of guys, we have like a, a special bond, you know, like when dudes get together and like we hang out, like, it's just, I don't know, it's like, I don't want to call it sacred because it's definitely not sacred. <laughs> it's like, there, it's definitely like, um, there's something holy about it. So like to have that, like before the faith, to have like a bunch of guy friends that we would hang out with and all that was great. But once we had our conversions and then we found other guys who cared about God. So then mm -hmm. these friendships with other males that were Christ-centered became really big and they really helped us so much. And I don't think I would have stuck with the faith if, I didn't, if we didn't have that strong like circle of people. Mm -hmm. guys and girls yeah i have to say personally our experience as men in the catholic church especially young men when we did have our conversions not too long ago but still still not too short ago if that even makes right. sense um <laughs> uh basically our experience wasn't normal because we had an incredible uh pastor who got assigned to our parish that's how we had our conversion um and he has a knack specifically for like converting young men like he's just amazing at it uh, very open to the mystical, very, a uh, very Catholic, you know, very Orthodox, but um, just has a knack for things. So a really great father figure. It all started with a great pastor, uh, which then started a, um, he formed a young adult group with a really dynamic youth minister. Mm -hmm. And um, just a lot of guys happened to go to that young adult group. It was kind of an even split 50, 50 guys and girls. Uh, a lot of the time you're on campus uh, ministries or young adult groups, youth groups. It's a little more girls than guys. They tend to be a little more active. Um, we got, um, I don't want to say lucky, but we were blessed to have um, just a lot of great dudes there that just happened to be at this um, this young adult group. And then, of course, the pastor leading us. So we were molded in um, special ways. Um, and we will actually kind of uh, tied in with our mission of JMJ missions is um, to try to bring that influence that we've received out into the world any way we can um, as as Catholic men. So. Absolutely. And plus community is so important in general. Absolutely. We know for a fact that so many saints knew each other, um, like St. Francis of Assisi, St. Claire of Assisi, then her younger sister, St. Agnes of Assisi. And uh, he actually helped them get into the convent, if I remember it right, by helping one of them cut their hair or something. I don't know. <laughs> They're like best friend shenanigans. Um, but so many saints knew each other. And just like the Bible says, iron sharpens iron, you know? And so it's sure. so important that we have that kind of community. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so how do you, I mean, coming from that experience and stuff, how do you raise children to be Catholic? And Dan just had the baby, so I'm so excited. <laughs> and I know you're only a five day old, you know, dad, but like still, um, or if you guys don't have kids and things of that nature, how do you inspire other men to live their faith boldly? Right. Dan, you want to go first because you're a legit dad. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So I've, yeah, I'm only five days into this, so I'm definitely gonna find some challenges that I probably didn't foresee. Because um, everyone kind of says it's like, in the beginning, it's like fake it till you make it with parenting, and then you kind of start to get it. Um, but my idea, here's like my ideal, like 
you know, vision of how I would like to be a father in a spiritual sense is um, to, of course, instill in your kids a great prayer life, a routine, a really, really special um, routine of like the rosary every night or some kind of prayer that fits, uh, fits the mold. Um, because if you don't get into a routine of praying all the time, it's almost like it's hard to pick it up. It's really hard to pick it up. Um, as, as a, you know, converts, reverts, you want to say to the faith, like, you know, unless you have some kind of miraculous experience or some kind of really big, you know, prodigal son kind of coming home turnaround, right. the odds of someone that is not used to praying, just getting up and praying and just changing their souls is low. So I think a, a good prayer routine, um, I always tell my students, I'm also a theology teacher in high school, um, cause they always ask like, Oh, like Mr. P, like, how are you going to like, you know, talk to your kids? How are you going to raise your kids? I think first and foremost, I plan on showing this kid, my, my son, um, Danny, the fourth, cause I'm the third, <laughs> um, that, uh, that I love him. Like me and my wife first and foremost, I think that you have to take notes off of God. How does God raise us? Or how does God take care of us? Number one, he just loves you unconditionally and just doesn't stop. So first that unconditional love. And then second, on top of that, a close second, I would say, is like a good formation. Like, okay, I love you unconditionally. You can tell me anything. If you mess up, if you sin, you can always come back to me. You can, you can open up to me. You know, you could almost be like almost the friend figure in certain circumstances, but more importantly, the parent figure in laying down the law. So I think a combination of like unconditional love, but also high standards um, in um, teaching your kids the faith, teach them how to pray. Um, I think explaining things to kids because like, I'll just go through, and you could probably talk about this, youth ministry experience and uh, experience as a teacher. If a kid understands why the church is teaching why it does, or understands like why you're telling them to do this or why you're punishing them, like that goes such a long way. My own dad, you know, if I was bad, he'd like freak out, you know, and I'd get like a little scared sometimes. I mean, cause you know, I mean, he wasn't like a mean guy, but like, you know, you disobey your dad, it's a little scary and you get to get him mad. I remember multiple times I would run up to my room crying, crying, crying. We were screaming at each other and he scared me or whatever. And then he would come up to my room afterwards, every, almost every time, like 20 minutes later, I'd hear a knock on the door. He'd open the door and he'd very gently, like almost like it was saddening him. He'd very gently say, do you know why I had to yell at you? Do you know why I had to like get so, so um, in your face about this? Do you know why I had to scare you? And I'd be like, sometimes I'd say yes, sometimes I'd say no. And if I said no, he would very gently explain to me what it means to be a good man, what it means to be a good, a good um, a Christian. He would even quote, the, he wasn't, I wouldn't grow up that spiritual, but he would quote the Bible sometimes. And because he would explain to me why, with a lot of love, I never held any kind of grudge against him and it made a really big impact on me. So I think a combination of those three things, um, well, you we can say four things. First, <laughs> unconditional love. Second, high standards. Third, explain why gently, why the church teaches what it does, why you're telling this. And fourth, a good prayer life. Now that's like a really, really ideal situation because um, like everyone's telling us running a household is really chaotic. So we'll see what happens. Uh, but I think we need to shoot for those, those things. I love that. <laughs> yeah, so- Dan, I, I'll go ahead. No, you, go for it. I, I totally agree with that, Dan. And, and you mentioned the, the father's love. The father's love is, is, is free. It's not, it's, not, it's not like force. It's not imposing. You know, he loves freely. There's, there's rules and certain like parameters and <laughs> to abide by. That's why he gave us the commandments. And that comes out um, kind of like it might not seem like love when parents are disciplining us. But in the end, it is love. And I think, you know, the, fa the way the father loves us freely is the way any parent should love their children freely and allowing them to be the best version of themselves. And the parent shouldn't ever impose or force anything if they have a certain vision for how they want the, the child to live their life, a certain path they want them to take. The parent shouldn't, shouldn't impose that. They should be there to guide them and to offer advice but to love them freely, allow them to make their own choices and guide them moralistically along the way. So that's what really I would say about that was mm -hmm. how the father loves us so beautifully and so freeingly. You know? Right, like, like never backing down on what's wrong and right, but, right. Knowing, but knowing that we sin, it being extremely gentle, kind of like how a good yeah. professor would be. 
and sure. like welcoming them back. So, they, so you always want to make it attractive for them to come back. Attractive. Yeah. And, they, and you always, at the, at the end of the day, you always want to be encouraging to them. Like, you know, you're going to be, you know, obviously you're a dad now, you're going to start to teach your son soon in a couple of years, you know, what's right and wrong. But you gently say, like your dad did, that wasn't very nice. Let's try to see how we could do better for next time, you know, and it right. goes a long way. And that really leaves a, a, a true seed in a, in, a, in a child's heart. And, right. and to know that their father's very gentle with them. Yeah, so the way that I do this, I don't have any real kids like Dan does, but I have been a, a teacher for five years. So I teach- Imaginary kids. kids. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not so I, teach, I teach middle schoolers. So they're fifth grade to eighth grade. And I've done it for five years. And like the way that I try to raise them in the faith is, like Rock said, I try to make the faith attractive for them. Like mm -hmm. the thing that happened to me the most, the biggest life change is once I really accepted God and like found God and practiced my faith, is I got really happy. I got really joyful and it just came out. Like it was everything that I did, it was just, I was just in a better mood all the time. So when I teach, that also comes out as well. Like when I'm up there talking about God, it's exciting for me. It's passionate and it comes out. And I think that makes them wonder like, what is this? Like, you know, like what, do, what does he have? Like a, what, what does he have that I don't? And another thing that I think is really important is uh, when my students speak, I'm not trying to just like trump up my teaching right now or something like that. <laughs> Um, when my students speak, I try really hard, and I think it's something the Holy Spirit has given me. I try really hard to listen to them, to like that's a great, that's them, a great point. To like let them know, and I think Dan, you mentioned that too a second ago. Like just to let them know that like when they speak, that they have my ear, and I'm not going to judge them. I'm not going to point my finger at them. I'm going to let them voice their opinions, and I'm going to tell them what the church teaches in the most gentle, non watered down way. But I'm just I want to want them to know that like they can have an opinion. And I even had a few students like write me a letter at like the end of the year and say like. Mr. McCullough, like, thank you so much. Like, you listened to me all the time. And, like, I noticed that all the time. So it, that kind of stuff just means a lot to me. So that's kind of how I, I try to do it, just by, through my example. You're right. Like, um, when it comes to church teachings, I mean, God doesn't force us to obey it. He invites us. Because if he forces yeah. us, it's not love. So when you teach like that, mm -hmm. and you're very, very accommodating with them, but never backing down, like, what's wrong or right, then you what we can do is then you when it comes to teaching especially or really i think anybody even like on a college scale adults when it comes to church teaching like every single church teaching can boil down to one of three things number one that we're made to love like jesus like the goal of life is to love like by putting yourself in the cross number two that god really does exist and has a plan for us he really does the church takes that very seriously and number three that every single human being has infinite dignity I literally taught my juniors, they're 16, 17 years old. I said, every single Catholic teaching on morals has to do with those three things. Prove me wrong. They couldn't, right? And when you put it that way, like, oh my gosh, it's all about love and about every person being special, like abortion, for example. That's just because we're all so special. Like you put it that way and the kids are like nodding their head by the end of class. You know what I mean? Like that's the way mm -hmm. you do it. So you encourage them through love and you invite them. And honestly, you get a lot of success that way. And you don't have to, and you don't have to bend any corners. You don't have to be unorthodox you can be totally orthodox and pull that off and it's very beautiful if you can i'm um, not that we're perfect we rely on god's grace and there's always outlying situations where like even the human part comes in but you do your best with that and you can get anybody really right because i also think i like what she said about how like god's love is free you know he freely gives it he doesn't force it upon us and yet he still understands that we have free will you know and so sometimes we won't choose the best path and yet he still keeps that door open. He still welcomes us back yeah, to open arms. Exactly. Absolutely. And the next, and the other thing that Anthony said was that, um, <clears throat> that he made it appealing to his students. Like, the, and the fun thing is, is that you don't have to make the church quote unquote modern in order to make it appealing to the young people. In fact, I have talked to multiple young people who are more attracted to the traditional Latin mass and the Eastern rite. Of, of Catholicism yeah. more than the modern rites and like, you know, stuff like that. And that's not to say that the Novus Ordo is bad or anything of that nature, but I think there's something to say when the younger generation is crying out for tradition. Absolutely. I love it. It's, so, it's more authentic. <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly. And so with that, with being a dad, Dan, and then of course you guys have your own responsibilities, Rocco and Anthony with your, you know, what you do. Um, you guys have a lot of responsibility like as men in general. So what are the most important responsibilities that you guys have as individuals? Sure, uh, I'll go first. 
Um, I think I really like, I try to be like the anchor for my family. Uh, you know, like there's a lot of times where my family can be going through a lot of different things. And I try to be the one that's just like level headed, you know what mm. I mean? Not that yes. they're crazy. Like they're definitely not. But like, I, yeah, it's like, I just try to keep like, try to keep the peace and try to keep, make sure everyone's thinking clearly. And I think I do that in the classroom too. <laughs> so not, not just in my family, but also. If you can, if you can control high schoolers, you can control anyone. <laughs> I think um, in general, it's just the responsibility to be an authentic witness to, to Christ and his church. And um the truth really, because it takes a lot of courage uh, to go against the grain of, especially of today's crazy society, to really be courageous and to be bold um, in the truth and to be a witness to that. It's a huge responsibility to us as, as laymen. Well, any lay person really, but on, you know, on this subject is of, of Catholic men, yeah. you know, as laymen, yeah. <clears throat> you know, it's funny on that note, um there's a study that I, that I saw like maybe two years ago. And it was um, a study of, um, I think it was like 200 straight women ages 18 to 35 or something like that. <laughs> and every single one of them, like every hundred percent said that they prefer a confident man over a not confident man. Um, now that spoke to me because I always wonder like, okay, I understand why guys are attracted to girls, but like, I'm always like, what the heck? Why do, why are girls attracted to guys? Like, I don't see any, I just don't. <laughs> and so then like, so I, I, I really have never, it's like bottled my mind. <laughs> so like, so, so I end up, and then I end up praying about that and thinking about it meditatively, not like in a weird way, but just in a meditative way, like it, it's confidence. It's like something, something that I, uh, I mean, God gives men and women different gifts, both equal, both beautiful, both, both um, equal in holiness and in dignity. <laughs> but different and complementary in the most beautiful way. Mm. And it seems that guys, and you said like being an anchor, like the, one of the gifts that guys have is that, that calm confidence. And I think the most, uh, the most confidence a guy can have, the best way he can be a calm, confident, reassuring presence that's gonna be really good for his family, for his, his congregation, for any youth groups or, or in his vocation, whatever he's doing is through Christ. Because like, let's be honest, like guys will pretend they're confident. They're really not <laughs> like, and, and if they, right, exactly. And if they, it's, be, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Rob. It, well, I was just going to say, you know, real quick that it's just kind of stemming from some sort of inse insecurity, well, cocky, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so they end up being cocky instead. And, and that's not, that's not actual confidence. Unfortunately, a lot of girls fall for that and then they get burnt. Um, how, how's a guy really going to be confident? Well, take your confidence out of yourself, put your identity into Christ, and then you stop taking yourself seriously. Because yeah. you're like, look, I, I, I have God. I don't care. <laughs> like, God, God's right. got me. He's going to forgive me my sins. He's going to take care of me. He's going to give me the grace to do whatever I need to do. Um, like, I'm a klutz, personally. I, I'll trip over my own feet. <laughs> yeah. It really is. It's bad. Like, five times a day. <laughs> that is not an attractive, confident quality. <laughs> But and I'm not perfect, but because I work on my faith, I know I have God and I just don't care if I trip over myself and I kind of own it. And then sure enough, after my conversion is when, you know, I, I think relationship with girls started getting better and relationship with friends started getting better. Cause I, I stopped taking myself seriously. Cause like, I mean, we know a, a true Catholic man, he, he knows that he's nothing without the Lord. And, be, and with that awareness comes like a freedom. You're just like you and you yeah. think God's got you. So I think, I think when it comes to like, getting that masculinity back like we need to hammer that down because so many guys are reaching for some goal and some standard that's made up by the world girls do it too it's just in a different way and it's really about letting go and letting the lord in your heart and then everything kind of just falls into place and your confidence comes because it's in him and not you right and that's actually humility that's where the humility comes in so um, sure yeah go ahead and then the confidence also comes with the affirmation because being affirmed by the Lord is the only affirmation that you need. That you need, so like, yeah. If you know that you're in a state of grace, that like you're in good standing right. with God and like you have his affirmation, like who cares if like this girl doesn't like you or if so-and-so doesn't want to be your friend, like it doesn't matter. Right. Because exactly. it, it, yeah, it's their loss, not yours at that point. I love My, it. I'm so sorry, Rocco, you go ahead. I'm sorry, just real quick. It's funny because uh, obviously we all went through school together from, you know, me and Dan, actually all through elementary school, middle school and high school. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny looking back on the things that used to bother us oh, because man. obviously we weren't rooted in God. We had no faith. We had faith foundation, but not to the extent of it is today. 
And it's just so funny looking back and, and, and reminiscing on some of the stories and making the biggest deal at that point in our lives. At that stage, it was like the, the smallest thing was like the end of the world to us, especially when it came to girls like, oh, did I say something that I impress yeah. her enough? Like, you know, it's like, <laughs> That's too funny. but it's just so funny thinking and looking back so we, on all that. We really wish that we know, we knew now what, you know what I'm trying to say. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, stumble upon that yeah, phrase all the time too. To <laughs> I mean, it's so true though, because the things that bothered us as teenagers, and I think a lot of it, like, yeah, I think it's difficult for teenagers to be rooted in Christ nowadays, especially just because a lot of their peers are not. Um, and again, that's why community is so important. But personally, I love how the men have that logic thing going on. Like you said, the cool head, the calm, collected. They know what to do in a crisis situation. Women are more just like, Brittany painted her nails purple instead of green like me. And now they don't match. And I can't be friends with Brittany anymore. Like we're very, we're very emotional. And then we're best friends like a week later. <laughs> but um, it's just crazy to me how some things that guys get upset over and girls get upset over are like completely different. Sure. And yet when we do have that root in Christ, it's like both of us are kind of more focused, like women and men are more focused on our relationship with Christ. And therefore through that, it's like this triangle effect and we come together. Exactly. Yeah. And then that in a group sense, like you're talking about community and talking about like young adult groups or youth groups or whatever, that becomes attractive to other people. And then guys and girls, there was a time in our young adult group when we first had our conversions because everyone was in such a good mood and people were so being authentically themselves and praying all the time, like full of the Holy Spirit, that there were people, like if a new person came to a young adult group and this was not fake, this was not like, oh, I need to be polite because that's the way I was raised, which is great. This was a genuine, like we were excited. We would line up to introduce ourselves to that person. And the group grew, it was like the biggest group by far in our diocese because everyone was so friendly because everyone felt free because we yeah. had the Lord, you know? Yeah. Um, so. Absolutely, I love that so much. Cause again, like I just found a community that's like that. And it just astounded me how the girls were not clicky or self-absorbed yeah. and the guys were not just right. wife hunting or girlfriend hunting. Like, <laughs> right, right, right. Cause I see that it's so many, you know, Catholic or just Christian in general, I guess like Protestant um stuff and it's just it gets exhausting because i feel like something's always being pressured on me and i can't just sure. let loose and have fun and enjoy um yeah. but with the whole community i'm sure comes some issues so have you guys ever faced issues as men in the catholic church um honestly n none that i can think of like our groups growing up like our young adult group definitely experienced some issues but i think they were like very specific like case specific like it wasn't, I don't think it was because of like our like masculinity or anything, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys have experienced anything. Um, I haven't, you know, on a, on like a big scale, but I think um, it's just, it's very hard to be a Catholic man in today's society. And to, when you know something's wrong and like someone's telling you about something that you don't agree with, it's hard to be sensitive but to stand for the truth too. And I, I found that the most difficult part about being a Catholic man in today's society, because you don't want to condone it. You don't want to say, oh, I totally agree with you just to be nice because you want to be sensitive. You always want to be encouraging and you, you never want them to feel like you are rude to them or mean to them. You always want to be loving towards them, but you, but there's rules that <laughs> there's just rules and it's hard to express those rules and to tell them what the right way is without coming off insensitive. I think that's been the hardest struggle for me. Kind of find that balance. I also think just today's <clears throat> society in general is um, super, super into empowering women, which is great. Um, but like, <laughs> can't we just empower like everybody? Like, cause once you start <laughs> singling out, or once you start singling out races <clears throat> or singling out genders or singling out, then like you're automatically like casting aside somebody else in general, really, in, in the reality, this the true sense of it, like everybody belongs to Christ. There's mm -hmm. no, what does St. Paul say? No, there's neither slave nor Greek, right? There's no, yeah. there's ge no Gentile nor Jew after that conversion. Um, he even says, I think he says male or female, mm -hmm. slave or, or owner. He, like, he says there's, there's no distinction <clears throat> in Christ. Yeah. And, when, and, and I think this is a symptom of our society not putting its identity in Christ. When you don't put your identity in Christ, you start putting it into random stuff. You know, yeah. you're just part of this community or that community or and then the devil starts using that to try to like, and it starts off with good intentions. Like, okay, like you want women to feel empowered. That's awesome. What's the devil do? He twists that into attacking men. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like in general, we just need to like 
love and respect everybody the way Christ wants us to love and respect everybody. See everyone for the individual child of God that they are. Yeah. Start from there instead of starting from a weird identity crisis that's not in God. Agreed. I also think like in a way the toxic feminist movement has really been trying to kill chivalry. Um, yeah. they, they really try to make men out to be this horrible beast that came from the woods and is still dragging his club and like knuckles on the ground and I'm just like whoa (laughs) whoa there (laughs) you know and a lot of the times they're just like all men are horrible and all men suck I'm like no no Karen just just the men you (laughs) (laughs) not your Karen Dan (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but it's just one of those things it it, it is so true though because I think women they they put all this responsibility on men and they're just like men should be this men should be that men should be that and I'm like well what are you doing to deserve those kinds of men right right well, yeah, like, yeah. like men should men should be that way. Men should try to aim for like high standards, but like it's the same thing as like parenting. You can't force it on them, or else they're just gonna rebel and freak out. So if you're just telling men that they're awful all the time instead of like encouraging them and being supportive of being a good man, what are they gonna do? They'll say, "I don't need this. I'm just gonna play Xbox for ten hours a day," and a lot of them do. <laughs> so like, yeah. Yeah. I'll just like, I don't, I'll, I'll just bail out. I don't, you know, if you're gonna treat me like that, I'll just, you know. Exactly. And I also think that what Archbishop Fulton Sheen used to say was that the society will kind of turn back when women start respecting themselves because then the men will start respecting the women. Wow. Yeah, I could see that. Makes sense. Absolutely. Because I think a big issue we have nowadays is women like to sell themselves out for sex thinking that it'll it'll complete them, it'll fill them, but in reality it doesn't. And men don't respect women who just throw themselves at them. They don't have respect for women like that. And I think the society likes to twist that and be like, oh, this is how you're happy. This is how, you know, not having that connection, you know, having sexual relationships at such young ages too. And um, it just keeps breaking and rebonding that, that there's like a chemical that makes us bond with people. And it makes it harder for women to bond with people the more they have sexual intimacy. And so through that, what ends up happening is like women degrade themselves to nothing but a tool and the men take advantage of it. Not like all men, but you know what I'm saying. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Sure. If men allow it, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and, and like, honestly, like, it, like people say, well, teach men not to be toxic. And like, that's true. But what we've done is instead of actually trying to, like you said, empower men to be better and like, for movements for men to like act chivalrous and act like a gentleman and treat a woman with respect and like have kids and be a good father and stuff like that we've said all right you know what we're, we're just going to go at it and we're going to reduce women's standards down to where men are yeah. instead of raising men's standards we've reduced women's standards and said well then we'll just be like men too and now everyone's depressed so it's yep. like <laughs> literally yeah, everybody I, I, no it's hard to it's so hard to find like i'm i lucked out well uh, it's a blessing it's a totally god's providence but you know i really like my, finding the wife that I have who's like super supportive and super chill and like it's really hard to find girls like that and it's hard to find good guys too I mean how many memes do you see on Instagram about like Christian dating and stuff like that because it's so it hard to- <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> yeah no absolutely I think that's completely like just one of those topics where it's like you could branch off into so many different areas and that should be a topic we go into again because I just feel like that's just such a you know, just like the toxic feminist movement and like they see this thing like toxic masculinity and I'm like, okay, so you call them toxic masculinity, but you can't see the hypocrisy of your own actions. Right, right. You know, and so that should be a whole other topic we get into. Yeah. Like so cool. <laughs> um, but in general, I mean, we talked about how like the women and stuff, if they, they raise the standards, the men will raise their standards too. And so I think that plays into this. But why do you guys think there is uh, like a decrease in seeing strong Catholic men? Uh, I think there's so many other distractions. I think there's so many other places to go. Um, right. Especially if you don't know who Christ is. Like if you don't know anything about the faith, you look at it and you think it's just like a bunch of people who condone sinners and like just judge people left and right. And so if you're not, if you don't actually know what the church is, then you're not going to be enticed to come and follow it. So I think there's just so many other things that, that are pulling guys in so many different directions. Like, I just think like all the, the culture of like social media, it's like, that's what's more important now is like exactly. being popular and, and finding a girl and 
like all these things that it's just it's just the distractions That's there's awesome. just this there's just been this sweeping tide of of like anti-godly movements that have taken place like more so the last 20 years and i think a lot of young men who maybe want to live out their faith are just afraid to because they feel so alienated because the grain of going against that is that much thicker that it takes so much more courage like you really have to be strong in today's society and a lot of men aren't willing to do that mm. and i think that's why we're seeing that that decrease in like living out your faith boldly courageously like being a, a true man masculinity all that all that and i think that's a huge uh, huge factor and i want to say one more thing dan if you don't mind it's that something i've noticed um maybe the differences in generations like uh, i'm a millennial but um I'm noticing like the younger generations, it's becoming more and more cool and trendy to not care. It's like, yeah. it's like the less you care, the cooler you are. Yeah. And that makes no sense. And I feel like that bleeds into everything. Like I even see that a little bit in professional athletes. Like, huh. like when I'm looking at them, I'm like, dude, like go out there and win the game. Like, you know what I mean? Like care about this. Like, and um, we're, just tell we're, they don't. This yeah, point, we're Sixers fans. They were just eliminated in a total upset. We're, yeah. we're still a little too salty yeah. about that. That's where it's coming from right yeah. now. <laughs> we go ahead, Dan. Okay, <laughs> sorry. I had to say that. Um, <laughs> but um, honestly, another going back to what you were saying before, Amber, it's kind of related, is um, another thing that's different about men and women is that um, there are some studies that have shown that men, in order to, to take part in something, um, they need like more a little more than women they need to feel like there's a goal or mission that they need to reach for like something with grit something that like really is like some heroic thing that they're made for and if they don't feel that like I said before they'll just check out and play video games all day um, yeah uh, there's a, a lot of studies coming out that show that and what I think is the most important thing is to remember is that that true goal and mission that we have the, 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 the most fun, the most powerful mission a man can have is to, is to evangelize, is right. to be a great Christian man. Like that's, there is no fire like the fire of the Holy Spirit inside your heart. I, I can tell you, I, I mean, we had conversions, right? We're, we're, we're like somewhat normal. <laughs> no, we're, we're normal, normal dudes that had conversions that lived like the high school, college party lifestyle for a time. And I will tell you, there is nothing, there is no sensation, there's no fire, as I said, like the fire of the Holy Spirit when it's inside of you. Like that dry, like that's the most masculine thing. And the cool thing is that it sure. belongs to men and women. It's not just a masculine thing, but it feels so like when you know that you have a mission to save souls, when you feel the Holy Spirit inside of you and, and like you feel Christ inside of you through your prayer life and, and, and you know what he's done for you, there is no more exciting thing for a guy or a girl to do than to get out and evangelize. That's why we started JMJ Missions. We literally can't think of anything more fun and more worthwhile to do. The problem is most men, most guys don't know that. I, don't, I think it's because they never felt it. Um, and I think guys need to start feeling the Holy Spirit in order to be inspired by that to start laying their lives down too. So I actually think that comes down to um, leaders at church. Like when I, was mm -hmm. at C when I went to CCD, religious ed, um, all I did was like, like, put like boogers and like like this <laughs> noses and draw, and draw like mustaches on jesus and it was and, uh, almost every single religious ed teacher i had was a woman which is fine but we didn't really do anything we just kind of like threw spitballs and no one really cared i never i never I, I, was, like, I never actually felt the fire of the holy spirit until i met my pastor and then met the family yeah, the that's, that's true. once i felt that and once we all right like you're saying rock right once once we felt that it was like man, it's go time. It's go time. I, we, we know what our mission is. So I think we need more, the, the, the few men that are active now, we need them to get out there and spread the fire and women too. Cause like, like I said, our, our, our conversion came through the family of Maria Esperanza, a woman, right? Um, so the people that are active, they need to get out there and not be afraid to share that fire. And then it will spark something in a lot of young men, but it just, see, there seems to be a short of a, a shortage of the Holy Spirit sometimes in our church today. So. And in doing all that is when you become your most authentic self. Because, because now you know your mission and your... Uh... <laughs> Sorry, my cat decided to join. <laughs> Sorry, okay, continue. <laughs> yeah, because now you know your mission in God and you don't have to be fake anymore. You could truly live out your authentic vocation mm -hmm. in him.
Rock, that's two podcasts in a row that you were interrupted by something totally random. I'm sorry. <laughs> my, my cat doesn't know how to not come in during my podcast. Yeah, the, the last one we did, we were like 40 minutes in, and then all of a sudden we just heard like the loudest weed whacker, like right out of the <laughs> Really? Oh my goodness. Rock yeah. was talking about now the cat too, but the cat was a little cooler to look at than a weed Yeah, whacker. yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's kind of yeah. But I a little, love little more pleasant than a weed whacker, <laughs> you know. <laughs> just, just slightly more pleasant. Yeah, because yeah. a weed a weed whacker can't eat your chicken pot pie. <laughs> but no, I think those are all really good points because at the end of the day, I also think that oh my goodness, my cat's gonna destroy my shirt. I think that in general, when it comes to men being like, I don't know, just like the decline of the strong Catholic men, I think it also has to do with a decline of strong Catholic parents. Because most people I have talked to today that are around my age, maybe a little younger, is um, basically that they, the youngest ones, are the ones that want to convert. They're the ones that want to go to mass and go to confession, and they want to do all of this stuff, but the parents are the ones that don't want to do it. Um, the parents are the ones that don't want to go to church. They don't want to go to, you know, inspire their children to be a strong Catholic. And so that is a theme that I have been seeing more and more amongst, sorry, Anthony, millennials. <laughs> well, actually, I think you all are millennials, <laughs> um, but it's just like one of those things where I, I've seen that in like millennial families where the parents who are usually millennial usually aren't religious at all. They're usually new age or something else. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the times it's the children who are really trying to bring back that tradition. Wow. So it's crazy. And then, so you guys came back into faith. I know you guys said that your pastor was a huge influence. Are there any other big role models that um, allowed you guys to be strong in your faith? They could be saints or people. For me, I, I think in the, in the definitely in, in the Catholic world, I'm a huge fan, huge fan of Pope Benedict. I mm. love Pope Benedict. Um, read a lot of his literature. Um, he was, I don't know if you ever read Light of the World. It's not something he wrote, but it's a very candid interview he gives with like a agnostic German reporter. And he just stands so boldly for the faith and he doesn't back down to anything. And he's just like this shy, humble little man you know, like Theodore Roosevelt that carries like a big stick, like he just doesn't back down to anything. And it was just so admirable for me. Right. Uh, so he's, he's been very influential in my spirituality. I always admired Father Bishop Barron's work uh, at Word on Fire um, and just, just people in the media like that, like Jason Everett and uh, Christophonic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Saint Wise, I have two. I really like Saint Francis de Sales. He was huge in my conversion because he has a book. It's called The Introduction to the Devout Life. And mm -hmm. he just explains everything basically like for an idiot. And like at the time, like I was like a spiritual idiot. Like I knew nothing. So like just the way he explained everything was so logical. And like my brain just like loved it. Um, outside of that, it would be St. John Paul II. Just because, ah, oh, sorry, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> just because his life was so hard. How he, I'm not going to go into his life story, but you know, he lost every single one of his family members by the time he was 19. And yet he just kept on smiling. He kept getting closer to God. I feel like if that would happen to a lot of people, they would run away from God, but he ran closer to God. Sure. And just like, he has to be like the most joyful saint that I've ever seen or, or read or, or learned about. So I think it's the two of them. And then people that are here today, it's like Christophonic, like Rock said, and then Paul Kim. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of obsessed. Yeah, with true, true. Yeah. 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 I love it. Um, on the topic of John Paul, and um, I, I love what you said about that because he, he, you don't have to act like macho to be a really calm. In fact, when you try to do that too much, it's like a turnoff and it's fake. Um, but John Paul was that perfect blend of like super confident, always smiling, like nothing could touch him, super defense, you know, super well at defending the faith, never drifted away from the true Catholic sure. teachings, uh, yet was so charismatic and so likable. We need more dudes like that in the church today. Um, that's a really high bar. It's like the fastest canonized saint. <laughs> so we, we, need more, we need more dudes that are like half as much as like that. If we could get, if there were 50 people that were half like John Paul II, we'd have, we'd see tons of guys flocking back into the parishes because it's so attractive. You know what I mean? Um, and I think St. Joseph too, this yeah. year specifically. Um, you always think like, oh, well, there's nothing to say about St. Joseph. He only has like 
a few things said about him in the entire Bible. But actually, if you read, um, I think Amber, you mentioned it in our podcast, or, uh, our live with you or Instagram live, uh, Father Callaway's book. You read stuff like that and then you just meditate and pray on it. I had to give a couple talks on him this year for Lent. There are tons of things you can say about St. Joseph that um, you just have to dig a little deeper and think about. But what an incredible uh, role model he was. Um, and a little tidbit of information, a little weird fun fact. Um, while my wife was going through labor, I, was, I prayed really hard for this intercession of St. Joseph. And um, wow. uh, I, this is just a random thing that happened. And like this weird peace just flooded over me. And um, everything went like better than the doctors ever thought that it could. And it was once I started praying for the intercession of St. Joseph. Plus, my wife's just awesome. I have to keep that in there. But, um, but, uh, but yeah, love you, Karen. Um, <laughs> so uh, St. Joseph is like a dark horse in the faith. He really is. He's like a, you know, late round draft pick that just. You know, <laughs> absolutely. No, yeah, I know. I know a couple like absolutely. Um, St. Pope John Paul II, like when he died, I was four years old and I cried a lot <laughs> and when I got older and came back in my faith and I started learning more about him I learned that he loved camping and he loved fishing and he That's loved good. all of these things that were so normal and yet the victor of the vicar of Christ was camping yeah. he, he was yeah. shaving <laughs> in the woods he was fishing he had so much love in his heart for everybody and just so much love for the world that God gave us. And then the other person I really loved was St. Jose Marie Escriva. Like he was another one of my favorites. Sure. Um, St. Joseph, I've always been very close to and also St. Anthony. Those are my oh, nice. That's a good choice ones. there. Good choice. Right? There. I mean, if I lose anything, if I lose, yeah. uh, if I lose my faith, I call St. Anthony. I'm like, hell. <laughs> <laughs> Lose my car keys and St. Anthony's up there like face palming. He's like, again. <laughs> I feel like that should be your reels that you do. Like that oh, person just said should be a reel. Thank you. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Honestly, yeah. though. Oh my goodness. It's just it's crazy to me how like there are so many examples of good male Catholic role models out there today. And yet men still feel very alone. So if they don't have a good male role model in their life. Um, what can they do to learn more about manhood and maybe kickstart that if they really want to? I think the first step would be to get involved at the church because mm -hmm. like you're bound to find like a good dude there. Like uh, sometimes yeah. <laughs> like, you know, like my sister has been looking for her husband for a while. So like I pray for her all the time and I always tell her like, come to church with me. Like, you know, it's yeah. like, that's where you're going to find a good dude. Like you're not going to find them like at the bar or something. So starting at the church is always very <laughs> tough to look for, you know, for a male role model. In this, uh, in this digital age, you could always go online um, to find a lot of good role models. You know, the, the media is used for so many, like, horrible things, evil things, but could also use, be used for a lot of good things and holy things and educational things. And, and you know, that's what we're trying to do with JMJ. That's what you're doing, Amber, kind of like in your <laughs> apostolate. So we need more people like us. And I'm sure, um, thanks be to God, like a lot of our viewers, followers, subscribers have been, be, are they're being taught a lot and from what we've been given and they're being <clears throat> helped and inspired too. Love it. Yeah, um, and like Rock said on, on the topic of the internet, um, I showed my students Father Calloway's uh, conversion story. I don't know if you've ever heard his conversion story. It's absolutely amazing. There are some stories out there like that. And that's like a guy who was like a, like a, a man that got involved with a lot of the typical guy sins really badly, like really badly. Before yeah. this um, the kids were absolutely inspired by that. Um, so you can find great Catholic role models there. And I would say um, almost every male Catholic saint, like there's thousands of them. Almost like every single one of them. St. Augustine too just came to my mind. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love St. Augustine. Cause I, um, I wrote on my Twitter earlier today, like I've had tons of friends telling me like, Hey, I want to get closer to God, but I'm not ready to turn away from my ways yet. And I'm just like, quote, like putting a little like, quote, unquote, I'm like, St. Augustine is cackling in heaven at you right now. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so true. And I mean, I think also it's like all of those things, like getting involved with this church, all that stuff is so important. I also always suggest getting a confessor, a priest, or if you are a girl to get a nun, or a sister. Um, I think nuns are mainly cloistered, so probably more like a sister. But um, because that way you can have that like 
consistent role model, somebody who gets to know you one-on-one. -on -one. And while I am super inspired by everyone on YouTube and stuff, they're not tangible. I can't, right. Sure. Right. I, yeah, I can't true. tell them like, hey, this is concerning me. Can you give feedback? We're not at yeah. that point in technology That's yet. That's true. You know? That's true. <laughs> with where we're getting with AI systems, we might soon. But <laughs> yeah, it's like you were saying earlier, Amber, like community is so important. It's nice to have that virtual community. Yeah. But to have that community on a physical, tangible level is a whole different ball game. you know? Correct. Yeah, it's crazy. I know for me personally, when COVID hit, I met so many amazing people online, but I really started blossoming when I met people in person. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I think that's really important as well. And I guess the last tip I, or last tip, last question <laughs> I have is um, if you guys are in families or growing families or just inspiring other people, how do you go about growing that faith in your families? Me? <laughs> <laughs> and first. Uh, New dad. <laughs> you have the official family. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I already mentioned those like four pillars that just kind of came to my mind on the spot. So they're not really pillars because they're not really well thought out. But on top of the four things from before, I guess I'll say, um, I think like you need to get your kids' opinions on things. Like mm -hmm. ask them to share from their heart. Like when you're eating at the dinner table, like I plan on asking my kids, like, what do you think about this? Uh, this just happened in the news. What do you think about that? Uh, what do you think about this saint? Like, I, this saint's going to be canonized soon. What do you think? What's your opinion on that? Because that is where you get to know where your kids are at spiritually. Um, it's so tempting just to say, like, here's the church teachings. Here's here's the box you have to you have to be in. Do it. And the kids might see something good in that and try to do it. But by the time they get, if it's too forced or it feels too forced, by the time they get to college, they're going to rebel or high school, they're going to like, you know what I mean? But if you're constantly getting to that, getting to the church's teachings, getting to the love of God, getting to Christ in a natural way by asking their opinions. I think that's a great way to grow spirituality uh, in your family and, and get the spiritual barometer up. Always asking them to share from your heart. Um, Servant of God, Maria Esperanza, like I said, soon to be saint, hopefully, that we uh, that caused our conversion. She was huge on that, like having it happen in a balanced, natural way from the heart. Um, and then guys, I guess I'll leave it to you when it comes to like a youth group or something like that, any other kind of family. Go for it. And just, just generally speaking, just making the Lord an utmost priority, um, no matter what the circumstances are. And it's hard for me, Amber, and to everyone listening, like I work in the restaurant business, so I work a lot of late nights, and it's very hard, and I have to work Sunday, so I have to make sure I'm well rested for the Sunday shift, but guess what? I have to make the Lord a priority first, so I have to get up. Even if I go to bed at two, three, four o'clock in the morning on a Saturday night and to be fresh and sharp the next day, I still have to go to mass. <laughs> you know, it's just a sacrifice I have to make. And making the Lord a priority is one thing parents should always, always instill in their children. Yeah, and that was good rock. And I think again, <laughs> it kind of just goes back to example. Like I th there are famous quotas, preach the gospel at all times when necessary, use words. That, that's kind of my MO especially with my immediate family. Like, I don't really just go up to them and say like, oh, did you know that Jesus said this? Like, I don't really do that to them. I just kind of just let them see it through my actions. <laughs> no, absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, as, as uh, what did Jesus say? A prophet's not accepted in his own native place. Not that, not that we're all like prophets because we're all obviously sinners, but um, your family knows you better than anybody else. And it's sometimes it's really hard for them to see the Holy Spirit working in you at all. <laughs> so Ant, that's a great point is like your actions are going to go a lot farther than your words huge, with your own huge. family yeah um and i would say like when it comes to, like a youth group or a spiritual family that you mentioned amber like just getting out there like go all, you have to be all systems go if you're starting a youth group a youth ministry or a campus minister listening to this or whoever you are you have to put a lot of work in and get like but we what was that axe the axe dinner the uh, young adult dinner we first attended anthony yeah. came because there was free food uh, the youth minister at our parish was so proactive. Um, they sent out a letter to every single parishioner, and it's a big parish in the entire church, a personal letter inviting them to the new young adult group with free food. Um, so you have to be really tenacious. Uh, don't hold anything back in how much you're doing to advertise, to market, put tons of energy into it when it comes to growing in a certain group. And then once you're actually in that group, of course, then it's a leading by example, as you said. I love that. I know for a fact, like what you said, like the leading by example, like in all of that, that is so, so important. And I think nowadays it's more important to acknowledge the gift that is suffering 
I feel like a lot of parents, they don't want their kids to suffer. And that's totally like, that's a natural inclination. They want to protect their kids. But I also think it's like futile because your kids are going to suffer in their lifetime. That's a whole part of being a a human being, but showing them how to carry that suffering in alignment with Christ, I think is also very important, especially in today's world. Yeah, that was big. That's true. And like, we definitely will suffer. And like, like you said, people tend to run from suffering, but mm-hmm. and like, we shouldn't go seeking them out. Like, we don't want to be like, <laughs> be like, all right, God, I have a broken arm. Give me a broken leg too. <laughs> so we shouldn't do that. But like when suffering comes our way, like we have to take it to God because every suffering that I've ever been through in my life has made me a better person. Like when, when I saw the light of the sure. end of the and that the season of that specific suffering was over, I came out better. So it's like the suffering is huge. Yeah. No, for sure. Yeah, and I yeah. think it's, I always think of people like the saints, like St. Therese of Lisieux, who would willingly put herself in situations to suffer just for um, the practice of humility and virtue. Yeah. Like, well, and you, yeah. when you look at the cross, I mean, like, there's no greater way to love than the cross and that's suffering. I mean, like, I asked the kids in my, my class, like, can you think of a more loving act than to suffer for God or somebody else? And they mm-hmm. can't. And I said, so redemptive suffering is um the best kept i think secret of catholic teaching because you look at every single saint the one thing well they have a few things they all had in common like mary and the eucharist like they're all obsessed with this thing um but also um redemptive suffering like to suffer the way jesus does that's what's going to touch hearts and minds and purify your soul in the best way to kind of catapult you into heaven absolutely I love that so much. Wow. We had such a great insight here. Yeah, we did. It was great. (laughs) That was great. So before we wrap up and everything like that, where can my listeners find you guys again last time so that they know? So you can find us on Instagram, JMJ Missions, TikTok, JMJ Missions, YouTube, JMJ Missions. You get the picture. (laughs) JMJ, like Jesus, Mary, Joseph. I love it. I love that so much. Well, thank you guys so much for coming out and being on my live, you know, podcast, all that fun stuff. Thank and you, we'll Amber. Have, yeah, of course. Yeah. We'll have to have another one soon where we talk about like the roles of like the toxic feminist movement and the toxic masculinity movement and all <laughs> this stuff, if that even exists, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. It, I think that would be a really great topic to also go on. But with all that being said, thank you so much for being here and I will talk to you guys later. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And with all of that being said, guys, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. I hope it was informative and hopefully gave you guys a little insight on what it means to be a Catholic man and hopefully inspired you. Well, I will talk to you guys in the next podcast. Bye. Do you have questions or comments about today's episode? Email me at thereligioushippie at gmail.com or leave a voice message at anchor.fm forward slash thereligioushippie. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks for listening. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Selling a little or a lot? Do your thing however you cha-ching with Shopify, the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. Get a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash offer 23. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Please be sure to rate and review this episode. This podcast is produced by Todd Fisher and distributed by Metacortex Publishing. This podcast is copyright. Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Information and opinions stated in this podcast should not be construed as medical advice. Please be sure to visit the official website for the International Association of Metatomics at metatomics.org or find us on social media for other unique content.